Now we come today to the last chapter, and we see now the church is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And it seems strange that we've looked in the fifth chapter, the church will be a bride, and now the church is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But the time words, of course, are important. Now, a friend of mine who's quite a wag and a humorist, he said, you know, said, I'm not sure but what that's the way it ought to be. That after they get married, that's when the war begins. And therefore, the church should be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Well, may I say that he's being facetious. Because the important thing is that in the future, the church will be presented to Christ. That's the expectation of the church. And today we're in the period of the engagement and the exhibition of the church before the world today. Now we come in this sixth chapter to another side, and the church is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, the soldier service of the church is important. Yonder in the city of Ephesus was that great temple of Diana, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the most pagan, heathen, grossly immoral, and now it's time for the believer to recognize that he's got an enemy. Not only did the Christians in Ephesus have an enemy, but we have an enemy today. We don't have a temple of Diana, but I think we have something infinitely worse. I think that we're seeing around us many things parading in the name, not only of religion, but of Christianity. That's not Christianity at all. Now you have here, in the first nine verses of this chapter 6, the soldier's relationship. Then verses 10 and 12, the soldier's enemy. We need to know our enemy. And the soldier's protection in verses 13 through 18. And then the soldier's example. Because you see, Paul was a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And then we have really the soldier's benediction. In verses 23 and 24. Now we come to the first part of the chapter, which opens with instructions to children and to parents and to servants and masters. It may seem very far-fetched and foreign to the life of the soldier, but such is due to an oversight in giving prominence to the training of the soldier. You see, a soldier's training does not start in boot camp. It begins when he's a child in the home, and that's important. This is something that we are told today that back in, you remember, during World War II, that they said in the Navy that in the early days of our nation, they had wooden ships and iron men. But today we have iron ships and paper doll men. Well, maybe that's not entirely accurate. But here is a report from the Great Lakes Naval Training Station, and will you listen to it? Some problems faced in the training of Navy personnel. Twenty percent of all young men in the United States attaining the age of Navy enlistment of 17 years must be rejected because of previous criminal records. Another 20 percent must be rejected because of personality psychological or health problems. Seven percent of all enlistees fail to measure up to recruit training. Severe problems are faced in the training of young men who must be trained in the simple things that should have been learned at home. At 17, a young man ought to be ready to launch into the training program. The Navy finds that they can easily put a uniform on the man. It is putting a man into the uniform that is causing such problems. Now, I understand that that's even greater today. And even in our so-called Christian schools, that the students graduating from Christian Bible schools and colleges, only 10% go into foreign missions. And 37% of graduating students go into home missions. 53% go into secular work. Of the 
who go to a foreign mission feel a startling number return after the first term as casualties. Training is essential if the soldiers to fight properly and be victorious over the enemy. This is important to see. Now we have, first of all, the soldiers' relationships in the first nine verses here. And we begin with him in the home as a child. That's where the preparation should begin. And every child is handicapped that doesn't get that first lesson that a soldier should have if he's out yonder fighting the battle of life. One of the great problems that young people are having today and older people out in this big, bad world that we live in is because they were not properly trained in the home. And properly trained actually means discipline. Now we're told here the first lesson that a soldier must learn is obedience to those in authority. He must follow orders. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, very candidly, the soldier must learn that he must obey. The basic training is therefore learned in the home. And after the soldiers learn to obey, then he's in a position to be promoted to the rank of an officer where he gives commands to others. Now, to know how to give commands depends largely on how the soldier learned to obey. Therefore, the basic training is found in the home with a parent-child relationship and the master-servant relationship. The victories of the Christian life are won in the home and today in the place of business. If you're going to win them in the place of business and out in this world today, they must be learned at home. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, he says. Now, that means that it's not only because it's according to the will of God, it's more than right, it's just. It's a righteous thing to do as it's God's way. You remember it said of the Lord Jesus, that as a boy, that he went down to Nazareth and he was subject to Joseph and Mary. Now, there are two essential factors which must be taken into account in this verse. It is assumed that Paul is talking about a Christian home. He's been talking about that all along in the marriage relationship. Now, a home such as he began discussing back there in chapter 5. Obedience of children to parents is confined to the circumference of in the Lord. Did you notice that? Obey your parents in the Lord. And I have great sympathy for a boy that accepts the Lord and has an unsaved father or mother. And there are those that are like that. Remember a man, he was a very godless man, heavy drinker, said to his boy, says, well, now that you become a Christian, you're going to start obeying me. The boy was a pretty smart boy. And he says, and when you become a Christian, I'll start obeying you. Well, that's, I think, the important thing. Now, it's in the Lord, and that's mentioned here. Christian parents have a privilege of claiming their children for the Lord. I think that we all ought to do that. Even where only one parent is a believer, he may claim that child for God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians seven fourteen, for the unbelieving husband, is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Now, this doesn't mean that the child is a believer just because he has a Christian parent, but it does mean that the parent has a right to claim that child. Now, we're talking about a Christian home. Then the second thing we need to keep in mind here, the word for obey is an altogether different word that we had in verse 22. A wives, submit yourselves to your husband. Here it means obey. It's a different word altogether. You see, the wife occupies a place of equality with the husband, and it's merely a question of headship. That's all. And here the child is to obey as the servant is to obey. It's the same word, 
that occurs down, we'll find it in verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. Now, disobedience to parents is the last and the lowest form of lawlessness to occur on this earth. I wonder if you realize that. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 2, where we're told about the characteristics that in the last days, perilous times shall arise. Well, what is it that'll arise? Men will be lovers of their own selves. They'll be covetous. They'll be boasters. They'll be proud. They'll be blasphemers. And then notice, disobedient to parents. That's one of the characteristics of the last day. Now, today, you hear so many cases of children actually killing their parents. And that's indicative of the time. And others, totally disobedient. Now, I think there comes a day in a boy's life when God has given him a nature where he no longer, now he's in rebellion against the parent. Why? Well, it's time for him to move out and get married and start a home of his own. That's the thing that's happened. God doesn't want him to be a mama's boy tied to his mama's apron string the rest of his life. God wants him to stand on his own two feet. But when he starts out, he's to be obedient and I was visiting in a home when I was a pastor many years ago. And there was a little two-year-old boy in that home. And the father and I couldn't even carry on a conversation because the little fellow, he occupied the center ring of the circus, and he was a little circus himself. And the dear little fellow was a brat, if you ask me. Oh, my. And the father says, you know, I just can't make that child obey me. A father weighed about 200 pounds, and that little fella, I don't imagine he went over 30, 40 pounds. And the father said, I can't make him obey me. I think he could have. I think he should have because of the fact that God intended for him to make him to obey him at that age. Now, in verses 2 and 3 here, "...honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee." and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, may I say to you that the Ten Commandments, I think we found that in this epistle, are not the norm for Christian living. But you see, it doesn't mean you can break them. Now, when you're a little fellow in the home, you're to honor your father and your mother. And you're to honor them all your life, by the life that you live. And the very interesting thing is that all of the commandments are repeated in the New Testament, with the exception of the Sabbath day. Now, I'll get some letters on that one. But you find that as no commandment given to believers today, the Sabbath day. But you're to honor your father and mother. And the interesting thing is here, this is a commandment that has a promise of long life to those who keep it. And it's repeated here. It's the first commandment with promise. Others didn't promise you anything. They promised you something if you didn't keep them, but nothing if you did. And I think that you have two examples of those who did not follow it in Scripture, and their life was short. Samson and Absalom. Samson, a judge, died a young man. Absalom rebelled against David, a young man. Now, I think that's interesting to know that the Ten commandments are given in the New Testament in the proper place, as this one is here, with the exception of the Sabbath day. Now, that's something for you to toy around with, by the way. Now, will you notice verse 4 here? And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture, or the discipline and admonition, instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, no such commandment was given to parents under the law. You see, under grace, there's always mutual responsibilities and interactive duties. The parent is not to vent a bad disposition on a child or punish him in a fit of rage. It's the parent's duty to teach the child the truths of the Scripture and then to live them before the child. 
Don't provoke your children to wrath. As a believer, you're to live like a believer. Now, fathers here, I think, includes the mothers also, but the emphasis, I think, is upon the father for the discipline and training of the child is actually his responsibility. But the mother's included. Children are not to be provoked to anger. Now, this doesn't mean that they're to be treated as if they're sort of a cross between an orchid and a piece of Dresden china. I think, frankly, the board of education should be applied to the seat of knowledge. And that quite frequently, by the way. Proverbs had a great deal to say about this. He says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Like the father whipping the boy, and he said to him, Son, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And the boy said, Yeah, but not in the same place. And then Proverbs 19:18 says, Chasten thy son while there's hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. And foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction you will drive it far from him. Proverbs 22, 15. And I think one of the great problems today with these little folk that are in rebellion today, before it's time for them to be in rebellion, is simply because they needed to be whipped. They needed to be taken to the woodshed. And I'm not trying to get even because I made quite a few trips there. And he says in 23, verse 13, "...withhold not correction from the child." For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Now, when you whip the child, if you're not whipping him in anger, he makes it very clear here, don't provoke your children to wrath because they see you're venting on them a mean disposition, but yet you should be disciplined in them and they won't die. Now, my mother whipped me a great deal more than my father did. In fact, she was at home with us, and I grew up as a boy. I was such a good boy, but I don't know why I seemed to get a whole lot of whippings. And I remember I learned something, and one of it was when she began to whip me with a switch, and she could have hurt, I would yell at the top of my voice, you are killing me, you are killing me. And I found out that she didn't want me to yell like that. The neighbors would hear, and the neighbors would say, my that boy's mother's killing him. And so she would always let up when I would begin to yell like that. I found out, you know, it sort of softened the punishment that you receive. But friends, actually, she wasn't killing me. And the thing is, if you beat him, he won't die. And just keep that in mind when the little fella yells at the top of his voice. And if you can do it and still smile and say, I'm doing it for the good of the boy. Now, we have here another statement of this. In Proverbs 29, 15, and 17, "...the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Correct thy son, he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul." Proverbs 29, 15, and 17. Now, a child in a Christian home should be given Christian instruction that he might come to a vital relationship with Christ and be fortified when he comes in contact with the world. Now, I want to say this, that every parent ought to have the privilege of leading their child to a saving knowledge of Christ. Now, my wife never was my assistant pastor. I insisted on that. I never let her become president of the Missionary Society or hold any office any women's organization, in any church I served. She was not my assistant. I told my board one time, I said, my wife is my wife. He's not the assistant pastor. And her business is to take care of the home and the child. And I think that's important. My wife had the privilege that I'm afraid very few parents have today. One time when I was out on a trip, our little girl, she, I don't think she's over seven or eight years old. She's out playing. And she came in. And we were visiting, at least they were visiting my wife's mother. She came in and she said to my wife, she said, Mama, I won't accept Jesus. 
And my wife took her in the bedroom, got down on her knees with her, and had the privilege of leading her own little child to the Lord. And I always felt that was much more important than to try to be a personal worker in the church. I know a great many personal workers today that have lost their children. My friend, that's your first responsibility is your own child. And you better concentrate on that child. And if Christians today would do that instead of attending to everybody else's business and trying to raise everybody else's child, you get your own child to the Lord first. And that's your first responsibility. You see, I'm a retired preacher now, and I'm on radio. Nobody can throw a rock at me and hit me right now. I can say this today. But you know the interesting thing? I always said that. And that's not the way to make friends and influence people. I found that out. But it's in God's Word, and what's in God's Word, I've always wanted to say it. Now, it says here that the discipline... That's to be of the Lord. Did you notice that? And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, that means of the Lord that discipline and instruction are administered in the name of the Lord. That's important. Now, from verses here 5 through 8, we have this question of servants. Now, will you listen to this? Bond servants our slaves, be obedient to your masters, your Lord, according to the flesh. They're just your master down here. With fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as to Christ, not with eye service, that is, don't watch the clock, as men pleases, don't butter up the boss, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the soul, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatsoever good each one shall have done, this shall he receive from the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Now, in order that I might not be misunderstood, I'm going to move on to verse 9, because you have the other side of the coin. And ye masters do the same things toward them, giving up your threatening knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no respect of persons with him. Now, this is for Christian workers and for Christian owners of the factory. This is for capital and labor when it's Christian. And when you have that, and I say it very kindly, you won't need a labor boss to come around to make the capitalist do what he ought to do. The interesting thing is, and I know of several businesses today run by Christians. I mean the owners are dedicated Christians, have chapel service and on their own time, and they pay their workers for it. Several like that. And they're prosperous concerns. God has blessed them, and they don't need a union. One of the employees of that place said, if we were under union, we wouldn't be making what we're making right now. So that we're talking now about Christians, Christian workers and Christian owners of the factory. That's important. And there are two sides of the coin. In other words, we're just getting right down to the nitty-gritty. This is where you work, friends. And the relationship should be different among Christians. How wonderful it is. Now, even here in our radio office that we have, we don't pay as much to girls and men that work here in our office as they can earn on the outside. I'm sure they could go outside, get a job. In fact, we had one girl that got a job. I imagine she made a great deal more than she made. She's back with us. She'd rather have the less salary and work where it's a Christian atmosphere. May I say to you, this gets right down where you live today. And if you're a owner, the best way you can reveal your Christianity is the way that you conduct yourself with those working for you. And if you're a worker, the best way that you can reveal your Christianity is to those that you're working for. Now, we had read the passage that referred to labor, and so I reached ahead and read the passage that related to both, because it's like the relation of husband and wife. You have no right to lift one out to the exclusion of the other. 
And there is a responsibility put upon a believer who is a laborer, and also a responsibility put upon one who is a capitalist or one who is the employer. This is the employee and employer relationship. And in that day, it was actually a sharper division than that. It was really master and slave. And this passage reads like that. Bond servants, that is slaves, be obedient to your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the soul, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatsoever good each one shall have done, this shall he receive from the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Now, the question we've had before us has been that of submission first in the home, the husband and wife relationship, then the parent-child relationship. Now he moves out of the home, into the street, out to the workshop in the marts of trade, and into the office. And it's a different situation here between slave and master. There are no bonds of love such are found in the home. Yet children of God who are filled with the Holy Spirit should be submissive one to another. In fact, he began by saying, submit yourselves one to another. Now, that It's all right for Sunday, for the church service. But what about Monday morning when you go to work? You're working for a believer, and you are a believer. Or you are working men that are believers. Well, it's estimated that half of the population of the Roman Empire was slave. That is, there were 120 millions of people in the Roman Empire, approximately, Sixty million of those were slaves. Now, Christianity never made an attack upon the evil of slavery, but it reached down to the slave in his degradation and lifted him up, assuring him of his liberty in Christ, and preached a gospel that the very nature of it condemned slavery, and it eventually broke the shackles of slavery from the bodies of men and cut the fetters from their minds and souls. And in this country, the South had to lose. I'm a Southerner, but the South had to lose because slavery was wrong. And that doesn't mean that the North was right in their method, but it does mean that the principle of slavery was wrong. Now, there were in the Roman Empire multitudes of slaves who came to Christ. If you have my book on reasoning through Romans, you find out in chapter 16 that most of those that are mentioned there were slaves, that are mentioned by name. Now, the church began to reach actually into the praetorian guard of Caesar and into the palace itself. And now he says, be obedient. And the church did not instigate revolution against the evil practice of slavery. But it preached a gospel that was more revolutionary than a revolution has ever been. Because a revolution has always had its side effects, which has been bitterness and hatred that has existed through the centuries. But when the gospel of Christ is preached, it'll break down the middle wall of partition. I actually believe that today, if we had the preaching of the Word of God in this country, and there never was a time when America could have been called Christian, but we certainly are far from it today. But if it could be preached as it was in the early days, and those who professed to be Christian were obedient and loyal to those to whom we owe obedience and loyalty, it would have a tremendous effect today upon the public life of America and our contemporary society. You know, a man is not a Christian 
just because he's made a profession. He reveals that Christianity. And just to profess on Sunday you're a child of God is no good. Are you loyal to your employer? Are you faithful to him? Are you loyal and faithful to your family, to your home, to your church, to your pastor? And when a professing Christian is disloyal in these areas of his life, the chances are he'll be disloyal to Christ. And certainly he has no witness at all. Now, there's some details here we need to pay attention to. He says here that you are to be obedient to your masters according to the flesh. Paul makes it clear that slavery only applied to the bodies of man, never to the souls of man. And it was to be with fear and trembling. Now, that does not mean abject and base cringing before a master, but it does mean to treat him with respect and dignity. There's one thing today that I have no use for. It's a officer of a church who pretends to be loyal to his pastor, to his face, and then's disloyal to his back, or a member of a staff that is disloyal on the outside. To me, this is the lowest form of life today. You just don't get any lower than that. You and I should always treat with great respect and dignity those that are over us, by the way. Now he says, in singleness of your heart. And that means there's to be no duplicity, not being two-faced in it all, not licking the shoes of the employer, of the boss, when he's around, and then stabbing him in the back when he's away. And both of these are not the action, or the life of a Christian. Now he says you're to do this as to Christ. Now that shows that the slave has been lifted from the base position of degradation where he sullenly worked as little as possible and only when his master was watching. Now he's the slave of Christ, and Christ has made him free, and he's to look above the earthly master and his attempt to please his master in heaven. A master could control only the bodies of the slaves, and the slaves of Christ have yielded their souls to him, yea, their total personalities. You see, Paul called himself, Paul, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Now, he says, with good will doing service, shows that their attitudes should reflect their Christian service. When a child of God, whether a slave or a master, employee or employer, gets to the place where the motive of his life is to please Christ, then I tell you the hurdles posed by Captain and Labor are easily passed over. In our day, I think there's a new kind of slavery, and it's sweeping over the nations of the world. And in our own land, there is a slavery, and it's not only of the body, but of the mind. Such slavery, I think, is far more pernicious and deadly than that of the Roman Empire. And multiplied thousands are willing to make any sacrifice today to foreign ideology. You can call it anything you want to. I've had the privilege of speaking to a group of students from Berkeley here in California. These young men have turned to the Lord and their major's political economy. Now, there was a time when they were a slave to this form of political economy, to a particular system. And now they're delivered from that. As one young man told me, he said, one time I thought we could manipulate the economy and that we could make everybody prosperous and everybody happy. And he said, I see now that... Only Christ will be able to bring in that kind of a society. And that doesn't mean, he says, we're not going to work for it, but it does mean that we're going to know that our goal is limited, and only Christ can do it. 
Now, what is it today that can break the shackles? Therefore, it's only the power of the gospel of Christ. He says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, it's Christ that offers freedom. Think of the thousands today that are trapped by drugs, by alcohol. It's alarming the way alcoholism is taking over the lives of multitudes today. And I don't care to enter into that. But what we're talking about is there is a slavery that's about us. And a person who's working for another should serve as unto Christ, not unto the boss that's over them. The Saul of Tarsus was a slave to an ideology. He was a Pharisee. And he came to Christ, and he was made free. And immediately, though, he yielded to a new master. And he said, What wilt thou have me to do? And he became a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Now, that's the position, you see, the high position that the Lord has lifted the employee to. He's dignified labor. and doesn't make any difference whether a man's working at a bench or digging a ditch or working in an office or whether he's a miner down in the bowels of the earth or a farmer tilling the ground. Each one of them can say, I serve the Lord Christ if he's a child of God. When William Carey, remember the missionary, he plied to go as a foreign missionary. You remember that he repaired shoes, made shoes. And somebody said to him, what's your business? <laughs> and they did that in order actually to humiliate him because it was a slur on him. He wasn't an ordained minister. And they said, what's your business? Well, he had an answer. He says, my business is serving the Lord. And he says, I make shoes to pay expenses. Servant of Christ ought to be that kind of a worker today. Now, what about the master? What about the boss? Well, we're talking now to believers. And ye masters do the same things toward them, giving up your threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven. There is no respect of persons with him. Now, you must understand that you are the employer, that before Christ, you're just another man. There's no respect of persons with him. And what he said to labor applies to you. You come in under the same category, and you are to have a master, and your master is Christ. And this is the Christian relationship of capital and labor. And responsibilities are mutual. Masters are to adopt the same general attitude toward their servants, which is a servant of Christ. And they're not to take advantage of their position as master. They're not to abuse their power. They're not to threaten. And in the presence of Christ, the master and the servant stand on the same footing. They're brothers in Christ. And this relationship is seen in a very practical demonstration, I think, in the epistle of Philemon. You remember Philemon was a master, and he had a servant by the name, a slave by the name of Onesimus, that ran away from him. And according to the law of the day, he could have put him to death. But he didn't put him to death, because Paul sent him back with the epistle to Philemon. And he says in that epistle, you're to receive him, not now as a servant, a slave, but above a slave, a brother, beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, therefore, when a capital and labor are believers, you've got an altogether different relationship. It's not capital and labor. It's brothers. That's the thing that makes them partners now, I mentioned about a business over in Dallas, a great manufacturing concern over there employs several hundred men. And many of those that work there are believers. In fact, most of them are. And the owners are believers. And the very interesting thing is 
They don't need capital labor relationships there because they're all brothers, and you ought to see the way it works. And actually, those that work there, they share in the profits. One man said to me that worked there, and he's not what I'd call a very strong Christian. He said, you know, he says, it pays me to work hard here because he says, I share in the profits. May I say to you, what a difference it makes when that exists. Don't tell me Christianity is not practical. It is practical. It'll work. The thing that was said years ago, I think, by a great Chinese Christian, Sun Yat-sen, he commented on Christianity in this country. You must remember, he attended school over here, and he knew America pretty well. And he says it's not that in America that Christianity has been tried and found warning. He says the problem over there is it never has been tried. (laughs) That's the problem today. We've kept it back of stained glass windows. The nicest thing that anybody has ever said about my ministry, and especially this radio ministry, is a man up in San Francisco. And he's a broker, man of means, by the way, outstanding businessman. And he wrote me a letter, and he said, I listen to you on the way to work. Been listening now a long time. He's an officer in a church. I take it it's a liberal church. And this man's come a long way spiritually. And he said to me, he said, you know, you do not sound like you're speaking from the inside of stained glass windows. And that's the nicest thing you can say. Because, my friend, if Christianity can't move out of the sanctuary and get down yonder with the secular, there's something radically wrong with it. And it'll work if it's tried. And it'll work in this capital labor relationship. Now we come to the theme of this chapter, which is the church is a soldier. Believers, a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And now we are going to see, as we have seen the soldier's training here and his relationships, we see him in the home. That's where God begins with him. And then we see him moving out into the world. And he's either an employee or an employer. He has to be one or the other. And as a child of God, he's got to contribute to the welfare of the contemporary society. He has to be a producer one way or the other. So there was that relationship. But now we come to something that's very important, and we see the soldier's enemy because there's a battle to be fought. We're going to see that the thing that today is probably more misunderstood than anything else is the fact that the child of God is in a battle And the battle is being fought along spiritual lines. I've made a statement that has caused quite a bit of controversy, I understand. I've said that sometimes the most dangerous place you can be is in church on Sunday morning. You know, in Jerusalem, the most dangerous place to have been the night Jesus was arrested was not to have been with that bunch of Pharisees or with the cutthroats in the underworld. But the most dangerous place to have been would have been in that upper room where Jesus was. And you know why? The devil was there. He'd put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. He was there. And if Judas Iscariot was here today, and Simon Peter even, I think both of them would testify to the fact that was the most dangerous place to have been that night in Jerusalem. And so we need to recognize where the battle is being fought today, the spiritual battle going on right now. Now, I want to say something as kindly and as sweetly as I know how to say it. There is a great deal of discussion and argument and hard feelings that go on in Christian circles today. And a great deal of it is actually among fundamental believers. There are those that 
do not feel that somebody is as fundamental as they should be. And they talk a great deal about separation and that type of thing and about doctrine. I don't mind stating my entire position. I am premillennial, pre-trib, and a dispensationalist. I believe the whole ball of wax, my friend. I believe that. But I get a little weary today and actually just a little bored today with folk that are so insistent on dispensationalism, so insistent upon premillennialism, so insistent upon separation, and yet their lives are lived in a very careless manner, and it's not commensurate with this exalted and high position that we have. Now, we are seated in the heavenlies. That's wonderful. But, my friend, we are walking right down here on this earth, and this thing has to walk in shoe leather. And if it doesn't walk in shoe leather, I don't care how many Keswick conferences you go to, or Bible conferences, or Bible classes that you attend. But if this thing does not get down into your life, where you are living the Christian life, standing for the things of God, and you're doing it sweetly. You don't have to be mean and ugly. State your position. But you don't have to use the bitterness and the vitriol and the hatred that you see exhibited today. That hurts the cause of Christ a great deal. Now, why is it that You see so much of this exalted teaching and so high teaching and such low living. Well, may I say to you that there's some that are fundamental in their head, but they're sure liberal in their feet, that's for sure. And in their total living, they are that. Now, I'm not discrediting Bible conferences or Keswick conferences. I started the Keswick Conference in Southern California myself many years ago. It's been imitated again and again in this particular area. And I'm for it, and I'm for Bible conferences. I don't think anyone can say that I'm against these things. They might say it, but they couldn't be honest in saying it. But I'm saying it now because of the fact that there is that danger today of thinking just because we've got a head knowledge of some things, we've learned a vocabulary, and we are able to spout out our position rather lucidly and fluently. And because we can do that, that somehow or another, that's all that's needed, and we can live a very careless Christian life. Now, that is to misunderstand where the battle is going on today. Again, let me say this. I do not think that the devil is working down yonder in the nightclub uh, on Skid Row or that he is down with the underworld or the mafia and all of this group. I think he goes to church on Sunday morning. I think that he's working today on the spiritual front. And too many... Sleepy Christians seem to be totally unaware of that. There are too many Christians today that are concerned about closing up the cocktail parlor. And don't misunderstand me, it needs to be closed. But there are too many Christians that get involved in trying to close a cocktail parlor, and they need to close a few mouths today in Christian circles that are gossiping and talking too much. I say that the devil is working in an area where we least suspect him. And if you want to find him, I'll tell you where you can find him. Don't look for him Saturday night. He's not out on the town. He's gone to bed early so he can get up and go to church Sunday morning. And that's where you're going to find him. That's where the spiritual battle is being fought, where a man is giving out the Word of God, where church is standing for the Word of God. 
That's the place he wants to destroy, my friend, and that's the man that he wants to destroy. Therefore, that's where the spiritual battle is. Now, I said at the beginning of our study in the book of Ephesians that it was like the book of Joshua, that what Joshua is to the Old Testament, Ephesians is to the New Testament, or turning that around, that Ephesians is the Joshua of the New Testament, And Joshua is the Ephesians of the Old Testament. And I took that at the very beginning. And then probably you thought I forgot the subject. But we're back to it now and see application of it. Now, when the children of Israel came into the promised land, that's not a picture of heaven at all. The Jordan River is not a picture of our death. If you want to sing on... Jordan's stormy banks, I stand and cast a wistful eye. You want to do that why you can, but when you really see the Jordan River, you'll find out that you've been certainly disappointed in that muddy little stream. It doesn't speak of our death at all. It actually speaks of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you and I cross over out of the wilderness of this world into Canaan. And that's right here and now. The child of God should be living in Canaan. And in Canaan, it's not heaven, because when the children of Israel crossed over, there were enemies in the land. There were battles to be fought, and there were victories to be won. And today, we've come to that place of soldier service now, and we see the battle before us. The enemy now is marked out a soldier's enemy, and he's put before us. Now, when Joshua entered into the land, there were three enemies that are given to us in the book of Joshua. Jericho was standing right in the way. That was the first enemy. And Jericho represents the world. What Jericho was to Joshua, the world is to the Christian today. He was told to march around the city. He'd never fought it. And you can't overcome the world by fighting the world today. You'll make a mistake if you try that method. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And you and I have that enemy, and it's by faith that we'll get the victory in the only way we can over the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. These things are passing away, and the child of God is not to love them. And we are in that world, but we ought to also recognize we should have a Canaan experience. And then there's another enemy that Joshua had, and that was little Ai. Ai represents the flesh. You see, Joshua thought it'd be pretty easy to overcome Ai, and he sent up a small delegation, and believe me, they were really whipped. And they came back, and Joshua got down on his face and began to whimper and cry before God. And God says, get up off your face, Joshua. Cut out this blubbering in my presence. Israel hath sinned. And the problem today with many of us is that, yes, we've got a victory over the world. There are a lot of Christians marching around Jericho today, tooting a horn, like the children of Israel were blowing trumpets and they're saying, I don't do this, I don't do the other thing. But they sure been whipped by the flesh. They're overcome by a temper. They're overcome by the sin of gossiping, lying. Christian man came to me some time ago and he said, why in the world is it that I just continue to lie about everything? Well, the flesh is getting the victory over a lot of us, friend. And Ai represents the flesh. Then there were the Gibeonites. They were clever, sly rascals. They really just lived over the hill from where the children of Israel were. You remember, they deceived Joshua. They took old moldy bread, and they took worn-out shoes, and they made everything look like they had made a long journey, and they came into camp where Joshua was, and they said, Brother, we have heard about you. My, we've heard how God has given you victories in this land. And we want to make a treaty with you. We want to be a friend of you. 
Oh, my, that's the way the devil approaches us. He deceives us, you see. How deceiving. He makes his ministers angels of light. Somebody said to me concerning one of these leaders of a cult, they said, you know, I listened to that man. My, how attractive he is. How personable he is. Actually, how really wonderful he is. He thrilled me. (laughs) May I say to you, the devil makes his ministers ministers of light. (laughs) You think that he's going to knock on your door one day and say, Look, I'm the devil. I'm here to take you in. I'm going to fool you. May I say to you, that's not the way he'll approach you. He will knock on your door and say, I've got some literature for you. Or he'll use other methods to deceive you. He may say, Now, look. I know your church is going liberal, but remember, Grandpa had a pew in the church, and that window up there is named for Grandma. We can't afford to leave this church because we've got so much here. That's what the devil says. God says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And the Lord says it in a nice, sweet way. And the devil, he imitates him. The devil says, oh, so sweetly, we just need you here. Stick around, and that's what happens. My, the devil is so subtle, and the Gibeonites fooled Joshua, and he made a treaty with him. And they were the only ones that got him in trouble. Actually, of course, Ai, he had to confess his sin. He says, Israel hath sinned. That sin had to be dealt with and put away before God would give a victory. That's the way we overcome in the flesh. If we confess our sin. But what about the Gibeonites? Well, my friend, if you're going to line up with them, you're going to find yourself defeated. There's going to be no question about that. Now, will you listen? What can we do? Well, we can't do it ourselves. You and I are no match for the devil. And you and I are not even told to fight him, by the way. He'll carry on the warfare. Now, I'm ready to read verses 10 through 12. And I'm reading from my translation, because right here, actually, again, I think the devil got in a lick here. Our translators actually watered down the text here. They said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Well, what in the world is he talking about? Well, he's talking about this spiritual wickedness talking about that which is satanic. Now, will you notice verse 10? Finally, Paul says, he's coming now to the end of the epistle. In conclusion, be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of his might. You cannot in your own strength and power overcome the devil. Be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, or put on the panoplyon of God in order that ye may be able to stand against the stratagems or the methodios of the devil. Paul definitely is making a play upon these two words here. Be strong, be strengthened in the Lord. That is the thing. That's the only place that you and I need to get power, and we need to recognize that. Now, he goes on to say that these enemies that are about us today, they're spiritual enemies. And we need, therefore, spiritual power to overcome them. And we are, therefore, to put on the armor of God. We're going to look at that armor in detail, by the way. It's important to see what it is. Now, only God's armor can withstand the strategy and onslaught of Satan. You see, he has all kinds of weapons today. He has missiles, spiritual missiles. And you have to have an anti-missile system if you're going to overcome it. And that's the only way that you can. And therefore, the Christian Soldier, we need to recognize, does not have an enemy to fight who's in the flesh and blood. No man should be our enemy that we're to fight him. The enemy's spiritual, 
and the warfare is spiritual. And it's well to note here that the flesh of the believer is not the enemy to be fought. The believer is to reckon the flesh dead and to yield to God. And the way of victory over the world, as we've seen, is the only way in the world you can overcome the world, through faith. Fighting the old nature will lead to defeat. Paul had that experience in the seventh of Romans. Now, the world is the enemy of the believer, yet the way to victory over the world is not by fighting. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, the devil is the enemy of every believer, and he has in battle array his minions arranged by rank. And wrestling here speaks of the hand-to-hand encounter with the spiritual forces of wickedness. Now, here is where I say that we do not have as strong as we should have in our translation. Now, listen to this. For our wrestling, verse 12, for our wrestling is not against blood and flesh, but against the principalities, against powers, against the world rulers of this darkness. These are all spiritual. Against the spiritual hosts of evil in the heavenly places. Now, this is the warfare that's going on. And the fallen angels of Satan are seen in this conflict that's in heaven. In the book of Daniel, I think we have probably the finest illustration of this in the 10th chapter of the book of Daniel of the fact that there's a spiritual enemy to be overcome. And I want to turn to that, but let me say this before that demonism today. If I'd said this even 10 years ago, which I did say and was certainly questioned at that time, As one dear lady said to me, Dr. McGee, you sound positively spooky. Well, maybe I do, but I'll say it again. And it's this. There is a demonic world around us today, and it's manifesting itself at the present hour. We have a church here in Southern California that's called the Church of Satan. And there are strange things happening today in certain of these weird, way-out groups. man said to me, he says, McGee, this thing is real today. Well, who said it wasn't real? If you're an unbeliever in this area, you ought to get your eyes open and see what's happening about us, how people are being ensnared and led into all of these things. And what we have today are these spiritual forces that are working in the world, and they're evil forces, and they're working against the church. They're working against the believer. They're working against God and against Christ in the world. And This idea today that somehow or another, that you and I are a match for this. Now, you can poo-poo it all you want to, but this thing just happens to be true. Now, principalities mean that they're demons that have the oversight of nations. Powers speak of those that are privates. They're demons that want to possess human beings. And then world rulers of this darkness are demons who have charge of Satan's worldly business. And spiritual wickedness in the heavenless are demons who have charge of religion. I think that he has the best organization that there is in the world today. And it's an organization where he is manipulating in this world. And my friend, he's running a great deal of this world today. The heartbreak, the heartache, the suffering, the tragedies, may I say to you, is the work of Satan in the background. And this is the thing that's causing the great problems that are in the world today. Now, let me turn to the thing that I had reference to. Over in Daniel, in the 10th chapter, verses 12 and 13, Daniel was praying a prayer, and he didn't get any answer. 
He prayed that prayer for three weeks, by the way. He tells us in the beginning of chapter 10, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshaz, and the thing was true. He says, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread. In other words, in all of that time, he was in prayer. Then this is what happened. When finally the angel came to him and touched him, verse 11, he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now come. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart, to understand, to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I'm come for thy words. Well, Daniel could say, where in the world have you been? Well, listen. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, now that was a demon, withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. He said, I had to go back for reinforcement. There's a spiritual battle going on. And my friends, when you go to church sleepy, you have to be defeated because that's where he's fighting today. Now, we don't seem to realize that there's a spiritual battle being carried on today and that there is a manifestation even at the present time of demonic power. And many people are being blinded and carried away in all kinds of cults and religions and isms with all kinds of beliefs. And as a result, the Word of God sinks into insignificance and into a minor place, even in many of our churches. My friend, the enemy that we have today is a spiritual enemy. That enemy is Satan and his hosts of demonic power. And that is where the battle is. That's where we need protection today. Now we are told in order to carry on this, we have the soldier's protection. And we are told, Wherefore, take up the panoplyon of God, in order that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Put on the armor of God, in order that ye might be able to stand and that having done all to stand. Now, we've identified the enemy. Now, Paul now begins to identify the arsenal, which is available for defense. Nowhere is the believer urged to attack or advance. The key word in this entire section is this, to stand, stand. That's the important thing. You know, the Scripture speaks of believers... As pilgrims, as pilgrims, we are to walk through the world. And as witnesses, we are to go, go to the ends of the earth. As athletes, we are to run. We are to run with our eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we are looking under Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one that we are to look to. When we're athletes, we're to run. But as fighters, we're to stand. And very frankly, I personally would rather do a great deal of old-fashioned standing. Now, many years ago, Billy Sunday, the evangelist, attracted a great deal of attention by, on the platform, he was fighting the devil. And by the way, I think that there was a great element of truth in that because it was a spiritual battle. And I think the battle is carried on where the Word of God is preached, where the gospel is given out. That's the battle line today. That's where the enemy is working today. I don't think the enemy, friends, is working down on Skid Row. I don't think that he's out partying Saturday night. I remember years ago when I was active in Youth for Christ as a young preacher. I was out every Saturday night. And we used to say at that time, Well, Saturday night's the devil's night. Now we're making it the Lord's night. Well, frankly, I think the devil was home in bed. I think he's resting up so he could come to church the next morning because of the fact that why should he want to fight his crowd? They belong to him. 
I'm not sure he's proud of them. I think he's ashamed of a lot of these alcoholics and these down-and-outers today and these up-and-outers. He could take no pride in them, but he's out fighting where the spiritual battle is. And Billy Sunday carried on a battle against the devil. Now, very frankly, I'd agree with that. But personally, I've never felt like that I should carry on that battle. That is, that I should make the attack. You don't have to make the attack. Just stand, because he's going to make the attack. Having done all to do just one thing, to stand. And I've never been enthusiastic when I hear a group of defeated Christians singing, Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war. May I say to you, it's more scriptural, I think, for the believer to sing, Stand up. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. And I believe today that we need to do some good, old-fashioned standing. And very frankly, this is an hour when my heart is sad, when I look today at a great many churches. Now, some folk that think I'm hard on the local church. I love the local church, and my heart goes out to the local pastors today. They are fighting the battle. Those are the men that are really on the battlefront today. I'm for him because he's the one. I happen to know I was a pastor a long time and always appreciated those that came in and stood shoulder to shoulder with me at that time. And I see churches that at one time were great churches, and the crowds flocked there. And they're no longer attending today. Attendance is way down. And the interest has gone. And what has happened today in many of these places? Well, I'll tell you what's happened. The members were blind to the fact where the battle was being fought. They thought because the finances came in, they thought because the crowds were there, they were winning the battle. And they themselves were losing it all the time. Oh, today that we might recognize where it is, and that today the local church might recognize that. How many of you really pray for your pastor on Saturday night? And instead of criticizing him on Sunday, pray for him. He needs your prayers. And you don't need to crucify the man today that's preaching the Word of God. The devil's going to see to that. You don't need to join that crowd You ought to uphold his hands as Moses held up his hands on behalf of Israel. And that's where the problem is today. That is the difficulty in the local church, and my heart goes out to these men today. Now will you notice, he says here in verse 14, "...stand therefore." My gracious alive, I get the impression that Paul is trying to tell us to stand and having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparedness or the equipment of the gospel of peace. Now, for the fourth time here, the believers commanded to stand. And this is the only place that I find Paul laying it on the line and speaking like a sergeant and saying in the command, stand. Before, when he opened this section, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, beg of you that you walk worthy. Now the command comes to us as soldiers, stand. That's the command today. Stand against the wiles of the devil, because he can outwit us unless we have on this armor. And now, will you notice this armor? We're to have our loins girded with truth. And that's very important. In the ancient garment of that day, and for the uniform of the soldier, the girdle about the loins, it held in place every other part of the outfit that you wear. And when you lose the girdle, why, well, to tell the truth, you're losing everything you got, my friend. Your garments fly open and your pants fall down. And I know that comedy is produced and people laugh when they see a man running or a man fighting and his trousers begin to droop. Uh, That's supposed to be funny. And a great battle in the past 
was won by a clever general who had his men go through and with the enemy. The enemy was asleep, and they just went through and ran a knife through the belt of the soldiers. Well, believe me, they were so busy the next morning holding up their trousers. They weren't able to shoot the guns, and this general won the battle because of that. Well, the girdle holds everything in place, and we're to be girded with truth. Now, what is truth? That's the Word of God. Now, there are a great many people today that are given a testimony. And I think they ought to sit down. Oh, I am being so ugly. Will you forgive me? But I want to speak that which is in my heart because very candidly, somebody needs to give out the Word of God today, and I want to give it out just as it's written. Now, there are people that are given a testimony, and they've got a thriller. Oh, these football players, these baseball players, these movie stars, these television stars. But you know, they do not know any more about the Bible than a goat grazing grass on a hillside. They're totally ignorant. What they need to do is to have their loins girded about with truth. That is the thing they need. They need to know the Word of God, because some of them are saying some very foolish things. And then every now and then, I could give you the names of a dozen back in my day that have gone off in the tangents and the cults and isms and everything under the sun, and they've really lost their testimony. Why? Well, simply because of the fact their loins were not girded about with truth. And it's important that you have a knowledge, a certain knowledge of the Word of God before you get up publicly and speak to folk. And that's the reason today that many of these testimonies, they're thrillers to hear, but they're coming from folk that are standing there, my friend, and they're about to lose all their spiritual garments, if you want to know the truth. They have to hold them up because they're not girded about with truth. And that is needed today. Now, will you notice that there's something else that we're told here? And I should mention this. Every piece of this armor really speaks of Christ. We're in Christ up there, and we should put him on down here. Paul has already told us that. Put on Christ, and he's the one that's the truth. And you and I should put him on in our lives. And uh, again, may I say this? A testimony that does not glorify Jesus Christ should not be given. And there are too many of them that glorify the individual. I was a great athlete, or I was a great this, that, or somebody else. And I today am turning over my wonderful talent to Jesus. And believe me, he's lucky to have in his crowd, because he is not so much, and his crowd is not so much. It's wonderful that he has me. My friend, you are lucky if you have him, let me tell you. And he didn't get very much when he got you and when he got me. And this is a day when the little fella really doesn't have very much to say. You've got to be somebody great in the eyes of the world. We need to have our loins girded about with truth. And Christ is the truth, and truth alone can meet error today. And you have on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, Christ is the righteousness of the believer. And I do think, though, that there is the practical righteousness that is here. The filthy rags of self-righteousness, that doesn't quite make a breastplate. But I do think that underneath that, there should be a heart and a conscience that is not disturbing the individual because that he's not right with God, there's sin in his life. Only the righteousness of Christ can enable the believer to stand before man and before God. But the heart that's going to be protected should be a heart that's not condemning the individual. The awful thing is, is to have sin in the life and to try to carry on the battle. We'll never win it that way. Now we have our feet shod with the preparedness or the equipment of the gospel of peace. Shoes are necessary to standing, you see. And they speak of the foundation. You've got to have a good solid foundation. Preparation is foundation. 
I remember in hand-to-hand combat, we were taught, make sure you get your feet anchored. Well, my friend, is your feet anchored today on the rock? And the gospel is the only way the believer must touch the world. And it's his foundation in this world. And again, Christ is that foundation. No other foundation can any man lay than that which is Jesus Christ. Put on Christ. Oh, how we need him today as we are facing a gainsaying world and also spiritual wickedness in the darkness of this world. The armor that the child of God is to wear in order that he might be able to stand against a spiritual enemy. And actually, the armor is a spiritual armor. And that armor is Christ, the living Christ, for he puts around his own. In the Old Testament, it was expressed even by Satan. There's a hedge about that man Job. And there's a great deal to this armor. Now, I think probably I should say that we have seen now that the very important part of the armor was the loins girded about with truth. That's the Word of God. Christ is the truth. And we need to know Him and to know the power of His resurrection. And we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. That is Christ. He's been made unto us righteousness. That's the only thing that can stand against the devil. But underneath it, there should be that heart and conscience that is clear because of sins confessed, because of a walk with God and fellowship with him. And then there should be the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And that means we should be on the foundation. I tell you, if we're standing on a slippery rock, the devil is going to be able to overthrow us. And if we're standing on sand... I tell you, we'll be overthrown very easily. Now he says in verse 16 through 18, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet, which is salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying on every occasion, through prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, it is probably better to say here, above all, taking the shield of faith, because the shield covered all of the armor. In other words, the shield we're talking about here literally means a door, and it was the shield for the heavy infantry. The hoplites came out, you know, and then there moved in the strong infantry. And this shield was like a big door. And the soldier, he stood back of it, fully protected. Now, have you ever noticed that in the Word of God that Christ is both the door to salvation and he's the door that protects the believer from the enemy without? And This is the picture that you have of him in chapter 10 of the Gospel of John. For instance, he says in verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, shall go in and out and find pasture. Now, that's salvation. What about security? Notice verse 27, 28. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Well, my friend, that's protection, is it not? Here is the shield of faith. Now, faith will enable us to lay hold of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's important. The interesting thing here is that faith enables us to stand back of this door and the fiery darts of the wicked one. And friends, he's shooting them fast and furious today. I remember when I was in college, and that's a long time ago. You have to have a good memory to remember back when I was in college. Well, 
When I was a student in college, I had a very brilliant professor who studied in Germany. He was the philosophy professor. I respected him a great deal. I respected his intellect. I think, actually, he was intellectually dishonest, but I did not know that at the time. And I looked up to him, and very frankly, he was taking my feet out from under me because I tried to answer him in class. I should have probably kept my mouth shut, but I was always a student that spoke out. I would say this, that I think the man came to be a good friend of mine. He and I used to walk together across the campus after the class and discuss these matters. I very frankly came to the place. I went to the Lord in prayer, and I said, Lord, if I can't believe your word, I don't want to go into ministry. And I was about ready to get out, and then the Lord, in a very miraculous way, sent me to hear a man who was the most brilliant man I think I ever listened to. And he gave me the answer to that. May I say to you that I then began to learn that When a fiery dart came my way, and I didn't have the answer, just put up a shield of faith. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And the very interesting thing is that the shield of faith has certainly batted down the fiery darts of the wicked one. Well, I can remember when the story of creation, it upset me terribly. Oh, boy, I was ready to get out of the ministry because I couldn't accept certain things. And very frankly, the problem wasn't with my little pygmy mind. I thought it was. The problem was I just didn't know enough. And I put up the shield of faith. And if today somebody would come along with something that would be upsetting, somebody said to me over in Israel, this man and I were walking along, and they were excavating. He says, suppose they dig up something down there that will look like it disproves the Bible. What position are you going to take? Well, I said, I'm going to put up the shield of faith, and that'll bat down the fiery dart of the wicked one, because I've learned that when the fiery dart is batted down, that you get the correct answer later on. How interesting that's been as we go along. I go back to the day when actually they questioned the fact whether John wrote the gospel of John. I think that's pretty well established today. I had questions about that at one time. And the fiery darts, friends, they're coming fast and furious today, and they're going to continue to come. The only thing that will bat them down is this shield of faith. And it's like a big door. These soldiers in the infantry, when the hoplites went by, they were generally mowed down in the Roman conflict. But these boys that came along, they are moving these tremendous shields. And they just put them out in front of them and stand back of them. And the enemy shoots at them everything they got. Then when the enemy is out of ammunition, here they come. (laughs) May I say to you, this is the way to stand the fiery darts. Then we're told here to take the helmet of salvation. Have you ever noticed the helmet protects the head? And God does appeal to the mind of man. I recognize he appeals to the heart. But God appeals to the mind. And he says in Isaiah 118, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And that is something that I think is very important to see. And then we read in Acts 24, 25, And as he reasoned, that is, Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. In other words, Felix had no answer for Paul because Paul appealed to the mind of this man as well as his heart. And then the Scripture says, Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God does not ask you to take a leap in the dark. That's not faith. A theology professor, a liberal, said many years ago when I was a student, he said, faith is a leap in the dark. God says, if it's a leap in the dark, don't take it, because I want you to leap into the light. 
I have a solid foundation for you. How wonderful it is. Now we are told here to take this helmet of salvation. Well, Christ is the salvation of the sinner. And he's the one to receive the glory in it all. That plume that's on top is Christ of the helmet. And he's been made unto a salvation. And when Christ was born, they said, call him Jesus. He's going to save his people from their sins. And Paul said to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, And let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, you see, all parts of the armor have been for defense. Have you noticed that? Everything is for the front of the individual. There is nothing made for retreat. If you retreat, you're going to get shot, just like Ahab did when he was riding out of the battle in a chariot. That's where they got to him. And believe me, my friend, a retreating Christian is certainly an open season for the enemy. The enemy can get through to him. Now we have here only two weapons for offense. First is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Did you notice that? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Christ is the living Word of God. And he used the Word of God to meet Satan in the hour of his temptation. And out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword in the battle of Armageddon in which he gains the victory. What is that sword? It's the Word of God, my beloved. And some of us need to have a sharp sword going out of our mouth, the Word of God, the only weapon of offense, my friend, that you and I are to use today is the Word of God. That's what we're trying to do. Then the second weapon of offense is prayer, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to come to that in another epistle. In fact, the little epistle of Jude, and I'm going to dwell on it at that time. But here, let me say, praying in the Holy Spirit is not turning in a grocery list to God at all. To pray in the Spirit means that you and I recognize our enemy today and that we lay hold of God for spiritual resources and we lay hold of God for that which is spiritual, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's what it means, I think, to pray in the Spirit. Now the soldier's example, and Paul is a good soldier, Jesus Christ, And here's his example. And on behalf of me, that to me may be given speech, an opening of my mouth to make known in boldness the mystery of the gospel. It was a mystery because it's not back in the Old Testament as such. That Christ died for our sins, buried, rose again the third day. And that's the message we should give out today. This is the Word of God. On behalf of which... I'm an ambassador in change in order that I may speak boldly in this as I ought to speak. And friends, may I say to you, that is the prayer that we cut it here, that there might be given to us an understanding and that there might be given to us a boldness to declare the Word of God. Oh, how important it is to see this. Now he goes on to say here in verse 21, And 22, but that ye also may know the things concerning me, what I do, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord. Tychicus was the pastor there. Later on, John became the pastor of the church in Ephesus. He shall make known all things to you, whom I have sent unto you for this very reason, that he might know the things concerning us, and that he might comfort your heart. Paul had a real concern for the brethren. Now we have the soldier's benediction, and this is proper. You remember General Douglas MacArthur said that soldiers do not die, old soldiers do not die, they just fade away. (laughs) Well, listen to Paul. He says here, "...peace to the brethren 
and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them who love our Lord Jesus Christ in incorruptness. And here was his swan song over in 2 Timothy 4, 6, and 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. How wonderful this is here. He concludes on this wonderful note, grace to you and love and faith. Love here means love for the other believers, which is the fruit of the Spirit. Faith means faith in Christ, which produces active love. And then we have here this marvelous, wonderful word of peace. And this is the peace of God that passeth all understanding. 